you grew up in the United States, you more than likely have heard of the Civil Rights Movement of the 1950s and 60s, and leaders like Martin Luther King Jr., Rosa Parks, or Malcolm X. But a large black communist movement also existed in the United States in the 1920s through the 1940s, and today there are other contemporary black communist and socialist groups, like the Black Socialists in America, or the African People's Socialist Party that advocate for black liberation through socialist restructuring instead of liberal reforms like the ones pushed for in the civil rights movement that ultimately didn't end the oppression of black Americans and other minority groups. It's no mystery why these black communist groups, which were so integral in achieving workers' rights and pushing for true liberation, are seldom mentioned in mainstream social studies education. For one, the United States was in an ideological war with communism through most of the 1900s, and two, most of these groups were not advocating for the peaceful or unifying reforms, but rather defensive tactics and separation from the white-ruled United States. Prominent black communist leader and writer Harry Haywood wrote in his 1957 article titled, For a Revolutionary Position on the Negro Question, The Negro Question can only be solved by giving the land to the Negro soil toiler, whose labor has paid for it a thousand times over. The Negro Question can only be solved on the basis of full development of the Negro nation in the Deep South under socialism. The advent of imperialism precluded the possibility of peaceful, democratic fusion of the Negro people into a single American nation, along with whites, Haywood said. Of course, it's important to note that the position of black separation was more understandable and more popular given the even more robust oppression black Americans in the South faced through most of the 18 and 1900s. It's also important to draw some distinctions between black nationalism and black separatism. While activists from both of these ideologies believed in black pride, cultural identity, and advocated for justice and the end of oppression, Black separatists like Haywood did not believe black Americans could ever coexist within the oppressive system set up in the U.S. It was a radical position, but if you read any works on the violence faced by black Americans in the South after emancipation, it's hard not to sympathize with this position. Besides the well-known Black Panther Party that was founded in the 1960s as a revolutionary socialist organization, other groups existed well before the Black Panthers, including the African Blood Brotherhood, founded in New York City in 1919, and the Alabama Communist Party, founded in the 1920s. The latter, and its vital role in increasing wages, resisting white supremacy, and pushing back against the injustices of race-based capitalism in the South, is well documented in the book Hammer and Ho, Alabama Communists During the Great Depression, by UCLA professor and historian Robin Kelly. In a 2010 interview with NPR, Kelly outlined how the Communist Party in Alabama used secretive tactics and accomplished feats like securing water and electricity supplies for black Americans and intimidating landlords who tried to evict black tenants. But in Alabama, they do little secret things like if the water was turned off, communists would figure out a way to turn the water back on. Or if the electricity was turned off, they used jumper cables to run electricity. Or if someone got evicted from their home, the communists as a group would go to the landlord and say, look, you have a choice. You can either put that guy or that family back into their house, or the next day your house may turn into firewood. So they may not be huge victories, but I know one thing, the infrastructure that was laid for what becomes the civil rights movement in Alabama was laid in many ways, not entirely, by the Communist Party. And the reason so many black Americans were drawn to communism wasn't necessarily related to strict belief in or understanding of leftist ideology. In the 1920s and 1930s, black illiteracy rates in the U.S. were hovering around 20%, and in the South they were even higher, and few had picked up a copy of the Communist Manifesto. But it didn't take reading theory to understand capitalism was oppressive in nature, while communism offered true equality, regardless of race. Communist Party activist Angelo Herndon remarked, We were called comrades without condescension or patronage. Better yet, we were treated like equals and brothers. Herndon was notable for his arrest in 1932 for bogus insurrection charges after police searched his hotel room and found Communist Party materials. The Communist Party's International Labor Defense Network helped secure Herndon's release and eventually the case made it to the United States Supreme Court, where the court ruled that the insurrection law was unconstitutional. This case was just one of many targeted at black communists in the South and the ideology that was leading the charge for black emancipation and an end to state-sanctioned oppression and violence toward African Americans. 
Another famous case of communist intervention in the racist South was the infamous 1931 Scottsboro Boys case. The International Labor Defense Network helped fight a false rape accusation targeted at nine African Americans in Scottsboro, Alabama. The case gained notoriety because of the multiple trials and retrials, and appeals to the United States Supreme Court. Death sentences for the falsely accused Scottsboro boys were eventually overturned, and charges against four of the nine accused were dropped, and the others were either released or escaped Alabama by 1946. And this wasn't the Communist Party's only involvement in the Deep South that drew so many black Americans to communism. While it's common to hear about the NAACP activities fighting for racial justice throughout the segregation era, the International Labor Defense Network is seldom mentioned, but it played an important role fighting injustices in the racist South. The organization was founded in 1925 by James P. Cannon and Bill Haywood as the U.S. branch of the Communist International's Red Aid Network. The organization set up its headquarters in Chicago, and its mission was to defend any member of the working class movement who came under persecution by the repressive capitalist system. At its peak, the ILD claimed more than 95,000 members through direct and affiliated memberships, and 156 branches throughout the country. The organization was eventually merged with the National Federation for Constitutional Liberties in 1946 to form the Civil Rights Congress, which continued to fight against racism and anti-communist oppression during the Cold War era until its dissolution in 1956. Due to financial strain and ongoing political pressure, black membership in communist parties and leftist organizations dropped dramatically during the Cold War, and many leftist activists decided to join in the larger liberal civil rights movements like MLK's. While reforms did come from the civil rights movement in the 50s and 60s, the reforms were largely ineffective, illustrated by the continuation of practices like school segregation, police brutality against communities of color, and maintained wealth and income disparities. Furthermore, liberals like to point to this movement as the reason why peaceful, negotiated reforms are effective, even though overwhelming evidence points to liberal and so-called peaceful reforms having minimal effects on systemic racism and inequality. While black leftist groups still exist today, it's vital we look to history to understand that true freedom and equality cannot come from within a system so rooted in racism and unjust hierarchies. The black communist leaders from the past were absolutely right in their assertion that black Americans would never be treated equally under capitalism. And with the growing tension in this country over racism and oppressive institutions like the police, it would be wise to draw from these revolutionary thinkers and use their ideas to help shape present and future movements. This is an incredibly dense topic and I'm sure I've missed some very important historical moments and neglected to mention a lot of key leaders and thinkers from this period. But if you'd like to learn more about the history of black communism in the US, I encourage you to pick up some of these works.